I can remember perfectly the first time I saw these pictures. I was a very young boy and I was absolutely stunned looking at the TV. I thought, what the fuck is this? It looks like the wacky races. Hello and welcome to this video. Today we are going to France, to the Paris region, to the Montlhéry Grand Prix circuit. It is one of the first speed circuits on this planet and it is still there. We are going through its history and also on a lap on board in the oval circuit. Are you ready? Let's go! Montlhéry is the first permanent racetrack in France and it is near Paris. It was initially called Autodrome Parisien. The track layout had not been changed since the 1920s and Montlhéry is the last historical European circuit with banking still in use. It was the dream of an ambitious industrialist and businessman, Alexandre Lamblin an inventor who loved aviation and motorsports. He was the captain of a radiator industry for automotive and aviation purpose, who is so passionate about sports, he created his own specialized newspaper called L'Aero. He wanted to provide Paris with a spin record ring like those of Brooklands in England, inaugurated in 1907. Indianapolis in the United States, 1911, Monza in Italy, 1922, or even Sicis Terra Mar in Spain, 1923. In January 1924, Lamblin bought land on a plateau overlooking the town of Lina in Esson, a stone's throw from the famous Arpaion straight line, which was used to establish numerous speed records. For Alexandre Lamblin, the speed ring is central, essential. He sees in it a gigantic velodrome on the scale of possible speeds for the time a great sports theatre. Designed by architect Raymond Jama, the truck's speed ring therefore takes an oval shape comprising two straight lines 180 meters apart. It has the notable feature of concave bands, their cubic parabolic shape with a vertical axis has a connection traced according to a logarithmic spiral. The design aims to allow one-ton vehicles to reach speeds of 220 km per hour at the apex of bands. 
the circuit measured on its central axis develops exactly 2,548 meters. The construction of the speed truck built on a structure that is both metal and concrete began on March 15, 1924. 1,000 tons of steel and 8,000 cubic meters of concrete are needed by 2,000 workers to carry out the work, the work lasting six months. The use of prefabricated elements make it an avant-garde site. Cold asphalt surfacing covers the trucks, except for the banked corners in concrete. The autodrome was inaugurated on October 4, 1924. The truck turns out to be very successful. Two months after its opening, a hundred records were recorded. In particular, during the period between 1925 and 1939, 86% of the world records were beaten here. This allowed Lina Montlhéry to set itself up as a world reference, alongside the circuits of Brooklands or Monza, built a few years earlier and renowned car races. The Automobile Club of France Grand Prix in the lead. Other challenges, then unheard of, such as races between a car and a plane, are fashionable and of interest to the general public. Anecdotally, the first to try to break a record on the new circuit was a cyclist, the Belgian Leo van der Stuift. On October 1st, 1924, he reached 107.7 km per hour on a bicycle. The French and international automobile industry has often taken its first steps there, on its world-renowned tracks and technical laboratories. The track consists of a 1.55-mile, 33-degree banked oval, Electric lighting is set up for nighttime riding and endurance record attempts. Without any neighborhood nearby, it was causing no significant noise troubles, thereby its development never ceased. The twisting 12.5 km road course that was completed in time to hold the 1925 French Grand Prix. Montlhéry offered various track combinations from 2.5 km to 12.5 km. The Grand Prix used the long circuit and was run clockwise. Oval racing, on the other hand, was run counterclockwise. The track shares some similarities with Monza by having an oval and a road course, but here the oval is always used even if only half of it. But also the angle of the banking is much higher. The winners of the initial 1925 1000km race, 80 laps on the 12.5km circuit, were Robert Benoit and Albert Divo, who were sharing the Delage No. 10 2LCV. The race was marked by a tragedy the fatal crash of Alfa Romeo driver Antonio Ascari, the father of future F1 star Alberto Ascari. He was the super driver of that time. Here's the full story. The 19th Grand Prix de l'Automobile Club de France was held in late July, but in conditions very different to those of our visit. Dark clouds raced overhead, whipped along by a wind that buffeted the 30,000-strong crowd. They had come in anticipation of a master class, for heading the field was the great Antonio Ascari. On paper, Ascari would face stiff competition from his teammate Giuseppe Campari and the Delages, driven by Robert Benoit and Louis Wagner. But in reality, the Italian was in unstoppable form. Driving the formidable Alfa Romeo P2, Ascari had destroyed the opposition in the previous Belgian Grand Prix at Spa. 
So far ahead of the game were the Italians, and so frustrated were the Belgian fans by their superiority, the P2's designer Vittorio Giano had even mocked the crowd by organized a mid-race picnic at a table in the pit lane. If Ascari was expecting to walk to an easy victory in France, he wasn't taking anything for granted. His competition record outside Italy was poor, a litany of bad luck and mechanical failure. And while he approached this season of World Championship races with great zeal, he had not been thrilled by what he saw on a preliminary spring visit to Montlhéry. I quote, This circuit presents difficulties and hazards that are useful to neither man nor machines, he stated. Along only two stretches and up on that splendid banked section can you do anything approaching full speed. For the remainder of the truck, you must slow down and be very careful you don't go off the truck. End quote. His words were to be painfully prophetic. The flag dropped early on race day, the drivers beginning their marathon exertions at 8 a.m. Ahead lay many hours of energy sapping, driving around G-force, including banking, through tight hairpins and crests that sent the cars airborne. At 620 miles, this was to be the longest one-day race yet held. Ascari began as he had finished in Belgium, streaking into a lead which, even after just 10 laps, seemed unassailable. After about two hours of running, he pulled off the banking for a routine pit stop. His lead was so great, said his crew, he could easily ride back and protect his car. Whether or not he slowed down is a matter of some debate, for although his lap times dropped off, it had begun to rain. On lap 23, the Alpha team became anxious. The Italian had failed to return. Racing back towards the banked section, Ascari had misjudged the conditions through an almost flat-out left-hander. Dropping a wheel off the road at the apex, the Alpha made contact with a series of posts used to line the edge of the truck. Sliding and then somersaulting along the track, the car flung its helpless driver out before cruelly crushing him. He died in the ambulance on the way to hospital. Note that emergency services took too long to arrive to the scene of the crash. Alfa Romeo subsequently withdrew from the race, leaving Benoit to win his home Grand Prix. At the muted post-race ceremony, the Frenchman drove his delage to the site of Ascari's demise and gently laid his victory wreath beside the track. Montlhéry's first Grand Prix had cost the life of the world's finest driver. His famous son, Alberto Ascari, died the same way in 1955 while practicing in the Monza truck, also after a fast left bend. The Autodrome Montlhéry became France's pre-war leading venue for motor racing. It hosted the race seven more times, in 1927, 1931, and five times between 1933 and 1937. It was two years before Montlhéry hosted the Grand Prix again, an event notable both for the domination of the Delages and the shock absence of the Bugattis, which were withdrawn at the last minute when Ettore Bugatti realized the chasm in performance between the two marks. The race was won by Robert Benoit in a deloge. In 1929, Helen Nice drove an Omega-6 to victory in the all-female Grand Prix of the third Journée Féminine. In 1931, the French Grand Prix at Montlhéry was a part of the inaugural 
Association Internacional de Automobile Club Reconnu, the forerunner to the FIA European Championship season. In this race, Bugatti would get his revenge when Achille Varzi and Louis Chiron's Type 51 won the race ahead of Campari's 8C Monza Alpha. This race took 10 hours. It was not run over a fixed distance. Those were the Grand Prix rules for that year. From 1933 to 1937, Montlhéry would become the sole host of the French Grand Prix, as the French were always changing the Grand Prix venue. Little had changed two years later when Giuseppe Campari won driving a Maserati, holding off the close attentions of Philippe Etoncelin. Again, the circuit earned a reputation as a car breaker, although the presence of five alphas in the top six was a fascinating clue to the outcome of the 1934 race. A race that saw the first ever appearance of the mighty Silver Arrows outside Germany. Also in 1933, it became the property of the car manufacturer Citroën who installed a testing facility for the brand's own cars. In 1934, Louis Chiron scored an unexpected victory for the Alfa Romeo P3 against the debut of the much-vaunted Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union teams. But the tide was clearly turning in Germany's favor. In 1935, not even a virtuoso performance from Tazio Nuvolari could prevent the inevitable. And when his aging alpha eventually retired, the door was left open for Rudolf Caracciola to lead home a Mercedes procession. It was the beginning of the end for Montlhéry as a Grand Prix venue. In 1936 and 37, rather than suffer the inevitable German wins, the organizers chose to ignore the presence of the German teams altogether and run the event for sports cars instead. The move proved universally unpopular, although at least they were guaranteed a French winner. So, while all around Europe race fans flocked to hear the whining of the supercharged Silver Arrows, at Montlhéry they were treated to the sight of Bugattis, Talbos and De La Hayes, driven by aging racers or local hot shoes. Raymond Somme and Jean-Pierre Vimil won in 1936 driving a Bugatti, while Louis Chiron has won driving a Talbot in 1937. In 1938, the circuit was stripped of the right to host the French Grand Prix. It would never hold it again. If you made it this far, you are probably enjoying this video, so please give it a like. And feel free to subscribe. It takes a long time and effort to produce these kind of videos, but sometimes they pop up around here. Let's proceed. In 1936, the Autodrome was closed. The bill providing for its acquisition by the state is not passed. The railway line passing through Lina, the Arpagonne, also ceases. Faced with the high operation costs, and the state of the concrete coating deteriorating, and no longer allowing the single-seaters to run at high speed, the administrators of the Autodrome had to resign themselves to its sale in 1939. The 750 hectares of the domain are acquired by the national domain, which places them at the disposal of the Ministry of War, in September 1939, the general staff of the army set up a training camp there, the center for the organization of motorcyclists and armored cars of Montlhéry. The Second World War had serious consequences for the circuit. It was badly damaged due to lack of maintenance. From mid-1944, the Americans used the Autodrome as a fuel reserve and transit camp. 
After the short period of its management by the American army, the autodrome was handed over to the French army, in particular under the leadership of Colonel Antoine Pay. In December 1946, the state signed a management contract with SETAC in return for the payment of an annual fee to the state, the Technical Union for the Automobile, Motorcycle and Cycle, UTAC, obtains a long-term lease to manage the trucks and the facilities of the autodrome on a civil basis subject to its restoration, maintenance and the organization of competitions. The ring opens again in February 1947. The full circuit in June 1947. This work will allow the circuit to diversify its activities, in particular in the technical and experimental fields, among others the test benches of the Auto Journal. UTAC operates the autodrome mainly for technical tests. From now on, the circuit is specially devoted to the tests of manufacturers by the UTAC. Here, the track went into a phase of modernization and construction of new facilities with the creation of new laboratories, the timing tower, grandstand, 34 pits, two foot bridges spanning the track and two chicanes, north and south of the circuit, being temporarily made with straw bales. Between 1948 and 1950, a 4.7 mile variant of the truck was used, followed by a combined road and truck circuit of 3.9 miles in 1952. After the war, racing returned to Montlhéry, although never in quite the same fashion as in the 30s. In the late 1950s and early 60s, it held a string of important sports car races such as the Paris 1000 km and the 12 Hours of Paris. Great names of the period took part in those events, the Rodriguez brothers earning Ferrari victories in 61 and 62. By 64 the field had grown even stronger with Graham Hill, Joe Bonnier, Jackie Stewart, Chris Amon, Edgar Barth and many others making an appearance. Once again, however, tragedy would strike the circuit, this time with the most serious consequences. Halfway into the 1964 race, torrential rains arrived, leaving the banking in a treacherous state. Several cars had already crashed out when Peter Lindner lost control of his Jaguar E-Type and careered into the open pit lane at unabated speed. There, waiting to pull away, was the Abarth of Franco Patria. In the collision, both drivers and three race officials lost their lives. The truck layout had not been changed since the 1920s and the circuit appeared to be very dangerous, even in the mid-60s, when drivers hardly seemed to care for safety. After the accident, some chicanes got added to the truck to prevent the cars reaching the pits at full speed. But those changes only delayed the decline of Montlhéry. 1970 saw Jack Brabham and François Sever winning the last of the famous 1000 km de Paris, races in a Matra 660. Only minor national championships raced at Montlhéry in the 70s. The tragedy cast a heavy shadow over Montlhéry's suitability as a venue for championship races. And while events did continue there until the early 70s, it was never at the same level. The circuit fell into decline and was closed in 1973. The current circuit was built in 1982 and international racing returned in 1994 with a revived Paris 1000 km for international GT racing. Although the course proved too bumpy and Montlhéry dropped once more from the international calendar a year later.
In 2004, the homologation of the circuit for competitions is withdrawn and the future of the autodrome is in danger. It will take the mobilization of former drivers Jean-Claude Androuet, Jean-Pierre Beltoise, Henri Pescarolo, Patrick Tambay to avoid the closure and demolition of the circuit. In the 2000s, UTAC undertook major renovation work to bring the track up to regulatory standards. Some protection fences for spectators, able to resist a 300 km per hour crash, are set with the increase of high-powered racing cars in the early 2000s. To the delight of motor enthusiasts, the speed circuit was finally accredited again in 2010. As a test center, UTAC Seram has worked for many years on the evolution of vehicles. It recently added to its facilities a driverless test truck in order to fine-tune the vehicles of the future. Last but not least, the racing track hosts a dozen or so popular events every year, attracting more than 100,000 spectators to this legendary track on an annual basis. But the historical motorsport brought Montlhéry back in the spotlight in the 1980s. Today, the Grand Prix de l'Age d'Or is one of the most important annual events in the historic scene. And this is it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like, comment if you have something to say or ask, and feel free to subscribe. This is a crazy channel with lots of different videos, but sometimes stuff like this pops up. Thanks for watching, and I see you in the next video. Take care.